verse 14 of Job chapter 1, it said, And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants of the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans made out the three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. Verse 19 says, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I'm only escaped alone to tell thee. But then Job arose. He rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. Look at 21. And said, Naked come I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now look at 22. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In the next few moments of time, I want to convey a thought that the Lord has given me for this family. Something good is about to happen. In the midst of your trials and your tests, and the pain and the suffering, the anguish, the uncertainty, the despondency, the loss, Something good is about to happen. How can God turn tragedy into triumph? How can he take me from a pit and bring me to the palace? Something good is about to happen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to here this afternoon and we want to say thank you. Thank you for your presence. We do not take that lightly. We are reverent before you. Most important is this word. We ask that this word will go forth in power and in demonstration of your spirit, a powerful seed planted in good ground to bring forth much fruit. Holy Spirit, I felt your presence here. I ask you to continue to lead, God, direct. Bring all things back to my remembrance. Whatsoever has been spoken, whatsoever has been written, give me insight for my eyesight. Open my ears that I may hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. And we leave this place, we will bear much fruit, and we will continue to operate in your gifts. So confirm your word with signs and wonders. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says... Amen and amen. Again, what a blessing <clears throat> and an honor it is to stand here this, this afternoon. I had just turned 18 years old when my stepfather of nine years suddenly died of pancreatic cancer. In fact, it's still at the top of the most heartbreaking things I think I have ever had to endure, fresh out of high school, going into my first year of college. Sitting there that summer day on August the 2nd, after the military salute, the playing of taps on a silver trumpet, the 21-gun salute, the presentation of the American flag, and also the presentation of the shells from those rifles that were shot. It seemed like my tears just weren't enough. Just weren't enough that day. 
I had felt if my breath was taken away out of my body, and my question was, what now? What now? And while I was watching my dad being lowered into the ground of Hilltop Cemetery in um, Colony, Oklahoma, it seemed like the hope of my future, 18 years old, was falling in that ground to being lowered. But I had one thing going for me. Actually, I had two. But I had one thing going for me. That was my faith in God. I didn't know much about God at 18 years old, but I knew enough. <laughs> you see, if you just have a small amount, even if it's a seed of a mustard seed, that's all you need. Because you can say to this mountain, be thou removed, and it will be cast into the sea. That's how powerful my God is. I had another thing, and I had my praying grandmother. Thank God for that. But I thought about this. At that moment, I didn't know what my future held, but I knew who held my future. I was, it was in 19... 89, and, and it was coming into this Persian Gulf War, and I thought about maybe I should go into the military, and maybe I should follow my stepfather's footsteps and, be, and go into the Air Force. I had offers to go, and I thought maybe even to the Army and to play the trombone, and had all of these opportunities, but I just something told me that I needed to stay home with my mother. I stayed home with her, and I attended college. And so I reflect on this thought for a reason, because I'm here to help you. This is not a time right now to blame God. It's not a time to blame God. It's so easy for us to put the blame on a superior being because we don't understand what's going on. I don't understand. You don't understand but we serve a God who understands. With the frame of, with, with the words of his mouth, he framed the entire universe. His faith in us and his trust in us should reciprocate. We should have that ability to say, God, you trust me with serving you. Should I trust you? And at times we fail, we come up short. Uh, nor is this a time not only to blame God, but nor is this a time to release ourselves from the commandments of his word. Did you hear what it said? I just read to you out of Job. He said that he, in all of this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Nor, that means he didn't blame God and he didn't sin. Is it okay to talk about sin today? It's not a very popular message. I realize that. And we all want to hear the shout and jump, and we're going to do that. But here I'm 18 years old. That afternoon, after the gravesite service, I watched. This is me. This is what happened to me. I watched in disbelief as my stepbrothers, my older brother, and some other family members, right after the funeral, buried my stepfather, I watched him open up 40 ounces and lit up some joints just outside of the community center. Right where were they eating dinner? Hmm. My thought was this. Here I'm a teenager. I'm a young man, and I'm thinking about what is happening here. And my thought is, if this is how you honor our dad, I don't want any part of it. Is it okay for somebody in these last days to stand up for what is right? Is it okay for somebody to go against the current? Is it okay for us to say, look, you can act a fool, but for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Is it okay? Where are we? We must know today that God has his finger on something in our life. And we've got to say, God, here I am. Do something good in my life. 
The reason I'm saying this is because we can forfeit the blessings of our God on our life because of making bad choices. That's all it, that's all it takes. Am I right, Pastor Carl? That's all it takes is one bad choice. One bad, you know, sometimes we blame so much on the devil when it never was the devil. It was a decision. It's time if we take ownership and responsibility. We got to be who we say we are. We can act one way in the church, but what about tomorrow morning? What about when we get out today? What about Tuesday, Wednesday? Come on. I need somebody that was a witness today that says, look, God called me to be the salt. God called me to be the salt of the earth. God called me to be the light of the world. God called me. I got to live it. Look at your neighbor and tell him, I got to live it. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because something good is about to happen. And I don't want anybody to miss it today. Something good is about to happen in your life. And the devil knows he's trying to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But something good is about to happen. And you got to guard that good. you got to say, not today. Today is God. Today, I make a decision. I'm not giving in to the temptation and the lust. My, oh my, this is some good preaching. Is it possible, is it possible that you guys could come back next Sunday morning, everybody? Is, <laughs> I've already tried to steal him. I've already tried, well, I don't mean steal, but I think the word is proselyte. I've been trying to take him. I mean, we got a good praise and worship team, my family, but I'm telling you, one was in a thousand, but two was in 10,000. Hey. I've had the privilege of pastor this family for almost two decades. I'm privileged to pastor them. I've watched this family succeed beyond measure in sports, in academics, in business, and in ministry. I was thinking about this, Pastor Bishop Crenshaw. I was thinking about this, Sister Lynn. Who did she root for? Was it Rivercrest? Was it Gosnell? Come on, Dion. It definitely wasn't Gosnell. <laughs> Was it Osceola? <laughs> De Dion said these altars are open. Hey, <laughs> I watched these. I watched these children succeed. All of them. I mean, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You had great leadership. You had great genes. But I've also watched this family endure storms. I've been with you every step of them, every step of the way. Pastor B Bishop knows. By the way, how many pastors do we have here? Raise your hand. I didn't, I didn't recognize the pastors. God, stand up, pastors. Come on. Stand up to your feet. Let's recognize. It's on. God bless you. We salute you. On, oh, my Lord, look at that. God bless you. We salute you. Amen. Double honor, the word tells us. I've watched him endure some storms. We've laughed together, and we've wept together. You know, Psalms 34, Division 34, and verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Oh, I love this next part. But the Lord, somebody say, but the Lord. Not some of them, but all of them. I look at the life of Job, and Job endured so much affliction. But we know that at the end of his test, God gave him double. Double for his trouble, right? Job's suffering was not in vain. Listen to what happened. Job 42 is said in verse 10, And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed. Oh, man, that's a Holy Ghost word for his friends. 
He didn't pray for himself. He prayed for others. Then it says, also the Lord gave Job twice. Somebody say twice. Something good is about to happen. Job gave, God gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren, all his sister, and they had been all acquaintance before he did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. <laughs> but look at 12. It says, So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. God, hey, listen, Robinson family, Barfield family, listen to me. I know you've been going through it. It seems like there's not been a, a, what, a day that you haven't faced trouble, you've not faced trial, but if you would just hold on to God, unchanging hand, something good is about to happen. He's taking you through it. He's not leaving you. He's taking you through it because he wants to show his glory to you. Hallelujah. Woo. Have you ever had the feeling down deep inside that you just know something good? Is about to happen. Bishop, has there been a time you walked in the sanctuary and you just knew that something good is about to happen? I'm telling you, everything can be falling apart in you and around you, and you could be facing all types of hell, but I'm telling you, there's something telling you, don't give up. Something telling you, hold on. Something telling you, get ready. Something telling you, it's on the way. Something good is about to happen. Something good is about to happen. That's the demeanor of Job. That's the demeanor of him. That's what he's thinking. But let me show you. Because if Job thought for a moment that his life was over, Job would have never blessed the name of the Lord. If Job thought it was all over and that was the end, he would have never fell down and worshiped. He knew that he served someone bigger than himself. He knew that that just can't be the end. And I'm telling you, there's some of you in this room, I'm standing with you. It's not over yet. It may look like it. You're hurting. You need healing. You don't know you're lost and confused. But I'm standing here to tell you, hold on to Jesus. Something good is about to happen. He arose. He rent his mantle. He shaved his head. He fell down upon the ground. And he worshiped. And he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and na naked shall I return. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Give me somebody that can say, I faced it. I've been hurting. But blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, yeah, it's okay. You can make eye contact with me. I know you've been through it. You're not here by accident. But something good is about to happen. You don't have to give up. You don't have to throw in the towel. It's not over. <laughs> something good is about to happen. I'm saying that over and over. I know it's redundant. But I'm saying it for a purpose. Because it's a rhema word for you. Sister Lynn, now I didn't know her like she knew her. I didn't know her like some of you knew her, but I will say this. To me, she was one of the most kindest people I ever met. I mean, she was one of the most kindest people I ever met. Now, Dion, Kevin, Jamie, 
and everybody else, that's up to you, okay? But Sister Lynn, to me, was one of the most kindest people I've ever met. She would visit our services, and she would sit right there. I can see her right now. I'd be preaching, and she'd be smiling. And after service, she'd come to me, and I would think, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. She had that sometimes demeanor about her, and I, I thought maybe I missed something. But she was always positive. She was always kind. She always said something kind to me. In the scripture of Psalms Division 1, 9, or excuse me, 116 and verse 15 tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. You know, that's a very odd scripture, isn't it? When I look at this word precious, that's my description. That's my description for Sister Deborah, for Sister Lynn. She's precious, and I don't take that term lightly, and you shouldn't either. Because if you look at that Hebrew word for the word precious, it's the Hebrew word yakar, and it means rare. It means valuable. It means costly and prized. Can you agree with me this afternoon? She was precious, precious. You know, it goes without saying, this woman of God, powerful woman of God, it took a precious woman of God to raise this family. Amen? Someone valuable, someone prized, someone costly, someone rare. Corey Ten Boom, survivor of the Holocaust. I use this saying quite often because it helps me. She quoted this. She said, I have learned to hold all things loosely so God will not have to pry them out of my hands. Man, that's powerful. Can I live a life where I'm just not gripping on something, but I'm just trusting in the Lord and that's the way she learned to live she learned to say hey God it, it's in your hands hey God the grandchildren is in your hands hey God Carl is in your hands amen and regardless of how tight the grip we have on things down here on earth I will say this nothing can compare to the eternal grip that God has on you and I we want to hold it tight we want to say, no, you can't have it. But God says, oh, you ain't going to want to tug a war with me. I'm the creator of matter. I'm the creator of all things. And if you don't want to pull against me, let me take control. And God's hand was on Sister Lynn since she entered this world. And his hand has led her back to him. You know, Job's double for his trouble, that, that expression, that's really just a reduction. It really is to what we will have in heaven. We want to say double for my trouble, but look, I mean, if I only got $2 and I get double, that's $4. That's not enough. Do you understand what I'm saying here? If you look at the book of Romans 8 and verse 18, it says, For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And so I think about what this is happening. Yeah, I got double for my trouble. That's fine. But there's something greater than just the double for my trouble. And you know what? Right now, Sister Deborah, Sister Lynn, she is in the midst of that great great glory of God. I often wonder, I'm getting up there in years, and I often wonder what the journey of heaven is going to look like. I wonder what that journey's like. I know they say in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, but really, what is it like? You know, <laughs> one day our meditation is going to be a manifestation. Amen? 
Hey, hey, David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I can imagine a lot. And then I thought about Sister Lynn and the times that Pastor Carl would call me and Sister Jamie, Pastor Jamie would call my beautiful First Lady Gospel Lighthouse Church, Crystal over here. I, I, I think of the times and they said, will you pray because Sister Deborah, Sister Lynn, she's in so much pain and she's hurting. Oh, but the sufferings of this present time. Oh, it's easier for us to say it, isn't it? But it's a lot, it's a lot harder when you are the one suffering. When you're the one going through it and you don't know what's going to happen and the doctors don't have an answer and they can't tell you what's going to take place. They can't tell you the medicine. They can't tell you how to, how to take care of you. And all you got to do is put your trust upon God. I would never do it, but I would take this Bible and I would have to stand on God's word regardless of what anybody else would say. Because it's not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. My, oh my. So this is how I pictured it. In this small mind, this is how I pictured Sister Lynn's journey. She has moved out of her home on West McKinney Drive and moved into her mansion on Golden Drive. <laughs> John 14, 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Look at your neighbor and say, Something good is about to happen. And so I began to wonder, and I had this thought. She stepped, she stepped off of C&J's 360 photo booth to standing in the front of God's 360 throne room. <laughs> I imagine that right now. Revelation 7 says, After this I behold and lo a great multitude, which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robe and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne in their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Man, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. My, something good is about to happen. Number three, she has traded in her earthly shine for an eternal shine. Pastor Carl, hear me. Heaven, showroom shine all the time. God is so beautiful in heaven. She's witnessing it right now. Revelation 21 and 19, it says, And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner and precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, the eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth a amethyst, and the twelfth gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold as it was transparent glass and I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it and the city had no need of the sun neither the moon to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the Lamb is the light thereof heaven must be beautiful right now something good is about to happen 
She has left her suffering and met her Savior. She has forgotten her frailty and she has found her family. Look at 1 Corinthians 13 and 12. It says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. What's that saying? That she is going to be known, or she is known in heaven right now. Listen, nobody's better than Teddy has welcomed his mama home. Listen, Mike C. has welcomed Welcomed his grandma home. Listen, Blossom Joy has welcomed her grand grandma home. Know this today, they're rejoicing in heaven. I like this one. Revelation 21 and verse 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make, hallelujah, all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am an Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. My oh my. Look at your neighbor and tell him something good is about to happen. Last one, number five. And I will, it's amazing how God puts things together. I could have never said it the way your, your beautiful wife, your evangelist said it. I could have never said it that way. But Sister Lynn, she has went from waiting on us to waiting for us. Come on now. That's you. She was serving you. She was helping you. She was cooking for you. But oh, now her cooking's done. She's done waiting on you. She's waiting for you. And the only way that's ever going to happen is when we meet her again. <laughs> Sister Lynn, right now in heaven, Sister Lynn, it's time for her to sit and be honored. Can you imagine? First Thessalonians. 4 verse 13 but I would not have you be ignorant brother concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain and the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep mm. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Look at your neighbor and tell him, we're in this together. Yeah, I've come too far from all the way from Enid, Oklahoma in 1971 to tell a very educated, a very spiritual, a very gifted, a very talented, a very wealthy people in God to tell you this. We are in this together. Nobody left behind. Nobody missing out. Something good is about to happen. And we don't want you to miss it. And if, if Lynn could open up this casket or walk down this aisle, she would tell you the same thing. 
children, something good is about to happen. Don't give up. Keep serving the Lord. Keep living for Him. Shout hallelujah. Two of the greatest words we'll ever hear is welcome home. Oh, this is not my home. I'm just passing through. This was not her home. She was just passing through. But can you imagine entering into that gate in that city and the master saying, Welcome home. Something good is about to happen. Let's stand together in this place. I'm going to turn this to Bishop here in a moment. But I want you to see this. Job 1 and 22. Look what it said. It said, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In the next few days, you can play softly. Sister, you guys are, you guys are wonderful. Thank you. In all of this, the next few days, the next weeks, the months, and in some cases, years, we will have some mercy moments about the loss of Sister Lynn. She's not lost, by the way. We know where she's at. She will be greatly missed. And then we have hope that we're going to be reunited. We're going to see her again. The only way that is going to happen is if we maintain our faith in Jesus. Eternity is too long to be wrong. I cannot judge you. I will not judge you. I'm not, that has not been my assignment, or nor will it ever be. But eternity is too long to be wrong. But today's a day of salvation. If you're here by chance and your relationship with God isn't what it once was or what it needs to be, today is a day of salvation. If you will simply acknowledge your sin, believe in your heart that Jesus died for that sin, Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Something good is about to happen in your life. It's all it takes. We shouldn't have to make it so difficult to perplex the minds of people who are the unchurched. We should make it as simple as we can. Because Romans 10 and 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Something good is about to happen. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap. Robinson family, you have something forward to look for. Amen. Your mother, your 